control. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry for the small technical difficulties. I thought I was following directions, but I wasn't. And um, I guess we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'll uh, probably be a little quick through some of the sections of this presentation. But thanks, everyone, for um, tuning in, uh, spending some time with us, uh, you know, to hear about um, my keynote here about Precursor. Um, Mario asked me to talk a bit about sort of how uh, this device I'm making uh, was made for sort of more everyday use. So we're going to be talking a bit more about um, some of the mechanical design aspects and the user uh, facing features of it. Um, so here's my talk. It's about trustful open hardware for everyday use. Um, and it's about a product that I'm making called Precursor. So uh, let's start the, the talk very briefly to review asked a question about trust you know where where does where does trust actually come from it's kind of an epistemological question but basically the, the 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 root of the question is how do i know i'm running the code i think i'm running and it's not just my computer showing me a screen that looks very similar to the code that i think i'm running um, and a lot of the trust models today come from the idea that you have a root of trust it's a piece of hardware that contains an unalterable trusted piece of ground truth from which you derive all other truths through cryptographic mechanisms typically. Um, so the problem with that model though is that hardware itself is not infallible, right? So there are some well-documented examples now, um, thanks to a bunch of instances that have happened, for example, of the NSA um, intercepting Cisco routers and inserting beacons on the inside of them to uh, a reporter, Andy uh, muller Magen, who had reported that he had a listening device inserted in his crypto phone. So this is actually a picture here in the middle of a, of a small microphone amplifier that was uh, uh, soldered onto the codec wires and it goes to a transmitter board that was elsewhere inside the device. So, and then also there's, you know, JTAG implants that are just, you can buy um, off the shelf and government programs to insert inside Dell powered servers and that sort of thing. So, there's, so it's established now that hardware is not infallible. Of course, a lot of people say, but Bunny, I'm just a regular boring person. No one's going to hack me, right? I'm not worth the effort to hack. Um, the flip side of that is that there's actually, thanks to modern supply chains and the way that uh, things work with Bug Online, there's everyday hacks now for everyday targets. Um, so the typical DIY supply chain attack, which doesn't require you to be a government agency to intercept the package and on the way to someone's door is to just buy an item, item online modify it, pack it back into the box and return it to the warehouse and then do whatever you're going to do in profit, right? So so there's a, some documented examples here of, of someone who, uh, this is from the wall.fail talk a couple years ago at, at CCC at the Congress, where someone had taken a Tracer box and they managed to open it and basically close it again without modifying um, the box too much. Uh, and, and, you know, it demonstrates the idea that you, you can get something online, but you can't necessarily um, uh, know what's on the inside of it, and it's not actually hard to execute the attack. In fact, actually, it's almost zero cost to the attacker. They, they get their money back for the thing they returned at the end of the day. You just have to be physically close to your targets that you're looking for. You can't specifically target it with a supply chain attack, but you can get within a geographical vicinity um, towards targets of interest. Um, so what it turns out in general is that the roots of trust and practice is that within your own environment, everything looks solid, but just don't look down what's beneath your castle in the sky, right? Just don't try to figure out, go too far deep into what your roots of trust are. Um, and the big problem at the end of the day is that, and the reason why we have the situation, why we have castle in the sky, we can't uh, look down too far, is that we can't hash hardware. So in software, we have a hash function, it's a cryptographic function we can use to sort of very quickly ins inspect every single last bit inside a binary and confirm that nothing has been modified on route to our computer, on route to our execution point. Um, the problem is in hardware, there's no way for us to go ahead and uh, just do a hash of all the atoms in, in, a, in, a, in a particular piece of device. And so we have a, what's a, a t called a time of check to time of use problem. So the time at which you inspect your hardware piece may be different from the time at which you would use it. So per, you know, perhaps the reporter who had his cryptophone um, hacked, you know, at one point had confidence in the device, but later on, someone had tampered with it, installed the microphone, and so now he, you have a time of check to time of use problem um, inside a piece of a hardware. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to sort of 
call myself out to say that I've always said you, there's always a bigger microscope. I'm a big fan of reverse engineering and finding out how things work and, and that sort of stuff. And so it's true. Yes, there are like very sophisticated technologies you can use to image hardware down to the you know transistor level, even the most recent process notes, right? Um, you can you can read some papers on it online. The problem is, is that, uh, you know, the size of the microscope that was used to do that paper is literally the size of building. This this round thing here is the light source that was used for the tachographic X-ray imaging that allowed people to 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 view those transistors at uh, such a fine level. So it's not it's not something you're going to park in the back of your house and use it to inspect everything that comes in from Amazon or something like that. Um, second problem is that you know verifying one chip only verifies one chip, right? It's not the case that you can just selectively say, I'm going to just check one of my RAM chips out of the dozen in my system and I'm going to be okay. You have to check every single one of them. Just one compromised component is all you need um, to go ahead and uh, uh, install an implant. Um, you know, we wouldn't random sample signature checks on our updates from, you know, they would download online. We do 100% check on all of our software. So why wouldn't you want to do that for your hardware as well? Um, and so then, you know, this leads us to the question of can we build an evidence-based case to trust our computers? Right now, we feel that we can trust our computers because there's a brand on it. People say, oh, Apple is, you know, invests all this money. They're all about privacy. And, you know, I like the Pixel phone because it's Google or whatever it is. But, you know, do people have evidence-based reasons to trust the specific piece of hardware they have in front of them at this point in time? Um, and in order to sort of build that case, um, I've come up with sort of three principles, I think, that the hardware designers need to obey to be able to get to the point of an evidence-based argument for trust in hardware. The first one is that, um, you know, complexity is the enemy of verification. The second is that we have to verify entire systems. And the third is that we need to empower end users to verify and seal the hardware. So very briefly, and I know many of you probably have heard these arguments from me over and over again, but uh, for the benefit of people who haven't heard it yet, I'm going to go very quickly over it. Um, when you know systems today are so complicated that even if you could take them apart and verify them like this is a picture of your typical smartphone over here you would destroy it right like you're, you know people who have tried to replace the battery in a smartphone you know, themselves have noticed that they have adhesives on the back panel that are so aggressive that you you essentially have to throw away the back panel and put a new back panel on right so people don't even want to take off their, their panel to even check if you know they have the gigabytes of memory that they were pro promised originally inside the system, right? It's they're really just sealed object at this point in time. So that's that's a, one problem. And it's also they're just too complicated. By the time you take it apart, you don't you don't even know what to look for on the inside. You could spend a lifetime trying to figure out if your phone's built correctly and still not find uh, the needle in the haystack. Um, and so there's a trade-off now that you, ha you you encounter sort of like. Um, sort of the, the, their verification, the ease of verification versus features and usability. So the example I like to use is you have these AirPods, which are magical, they stick in your ears, they don't have any wires in them. They probably have 100 million plus transistors on the inside. So good luck trying to find any sort of firmware bugs or in, on the inside that could, that could exfiltrate your conversation to someone else versus a very classic sort of headset that you would use with a boom mic on the inside it has exactly one transistor, which is the FET that's used to amplify the, the microphone itself and everything else you can verify using, you know, I mean, just it's a coil of wire, Maxwell's law, physics, these types of things. These two objects actually perform nominally almost the same thing. They're headphones, right? But one of them is incredibly much more complicated to verify, has a lot more opportunities for things to go wrong. The other one's very easy. But the trade-off is that you now have, you know, a wire that you have to have hanging off your head, which I have no problem with, but a lot of people seem to say, think that is like the worst thing ever, and it's completely worth all the um, trade-offs engendered in using it. Um, so the second uh, principle is that uh, we need to verify entire systems and not just the subcomponents on the inside. Very quickly, you know, uh, a lot of phones already contain a secure element on the inside, security enclave or whatever you want to call it, wherever the, wherever the brand is, and they're meant to keep your private keys private. So in the case of an OS um, exploit or something, even if the CPU is hacked, your keys are still safe. So therefore, you should be you should be good, all right, because it's like you know, your trust root is not compromised. The problem is, is that, and, and, and I, I used to call this the I.O. problem, I think more directly, it, we can call it the input method editor problem, the IME problem, is that even if your security enclave is is locking down all of your messages and using Signal and you've everything's end-to-end -end encrypted, you know, people feel very safe on all this, 
there's a thing that you did probably when you first booted your phone where you installed an IME and it popped up a little note, very much similar to the one on the right-hand side, which says, you know, this input method can collect all the text that you type, including personal data, passwords, and credit card numbers. Would you like to use it? And people go, okay. And then they're done, right? And so at this point in time, you've basically taken this entire, you know, you know, tree of security that you've done and just uprooted it and floated in the sky and just gave all the permission to whoever you're using for the IME at the end of the day. And everyone does this, right? So this is this is why you have to verify the entire system and not just one particular uh, component of it. Um, uh, and at the end, and, and, and then, you know, the third principle is that we need to make sure that uh, end users are able to actually do the verification themselves and ultimately seal the hardware. When I say verification, it means like verification at multiple levels. So circuit boards, uh, design level, chip level, right? Like we have to go down, 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 all the way to the bottom. Because the problem is, is that when you talk about these epistemological problems of trust, and you know where 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 does the trust lie? You really have to go um, pretty much down to the bottom level because because there's always there's another turtle underneath that 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 will that will cause a problem for you if you don't. Um, so you know, precursor itself is, and this is the project that I had referred to earlier. It's a it's a case study in verifiable hardware. So I wanted to. Uh, put together a system um, that could sort of try to meet these goals. I think they're hard goals to meet, but we, we're trying to move to the point where we can sort of facilitate an evidence-based trust relationship with our hardware, right? So, uh, you know, I want to build something that was simple in construction, open in design, yet sufficient in function at the end of the day. So, Precursor itself, you know, what are the functions that uh, I envision it could be used for? There's a picture right here on the right. It kind of looks like a, a, a mobile phone-ish. It's not a phone, um, you know, it doesn't have a, the ability to, you know, put it in a LTE card or something like this. It, it connects by Wi-Fi. Um, it, it, you know, it's designed for secure text messaging. It's, a, it's designed for voice chat. Um, we, we give it multilingual capability from day one, which is very important because um, actually it turns out one of the hardest, you know, if you, if you, um, anyone here who's sort of programmed in Rust and dug into the bottom of it, what is the hardest data type in Rust to deal with? It's not, you know, the U32 or the U64 or whatever it is. It's the care, right? Because a care is a UTF-8 thing which has a variable length size. You don't know how big is how big is your care. You don't know how big a care is, right? So human language itself is actually, you know, we, we take it for granted in C. We always think of it as, oh, it's obviously a, a byte, right? You know, it's not. It's a. It's actually one of Encapsulating human language in a small form factor design is one of the hardest things to do. So we've, we focused on that um, from day one um, because not the entire world doesn't speak English. Um, and we want to be able to do things like password management or maybe a crypto wallet, whatever you want. It's open source, right? So you can, there's a bunch of things you can do with it. But things we want to explicitly throw out from the design envelope from day one were things like web browsing. Um, because I kind of feel like you could do all this effort and then you throw a web browser on it and you just immediately undo it. I don't think the web, the web browser itself, I think is an unprovably difficult surface to trust, right? I don't think we're gonna get to the point of a, like a fully trustable web browser just because it has to do so much. Um, you know, video games, you can probably play Tetris on this, but I don't think you're gonna, like you're not gonna play a 3D, you know, shoot 'em up game on it. Um, and it's not designed for doing photos and videos. I think that's that's a that's a, a still a bit too high of a bar for today's open hardware capabilities. Maybe in the future, um, yeah, you can play Minesweeper on it. <laughs> um, so uh, precursor uh, is simple in construction. So the uh, you know the uh, this here is actually uh, a picture of actually all the parts that go into it. You can see, sort of see from the left. Um, you know, there's a case, there's a motherboard, there's a screen, backlight, um, sort of some shields for anti-tamper and, and RF management, keyboard, and a front bezel and a battery. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of, that's, it's really, it, it, if you think it's minimalist, that's the whole idea. It is, the, the idea is we tried to design out too much complexity so it could be something that we could verify at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> so for example, uh, we, we went with a physical keyboard, um, you know, it's a controversial decision. Virtual keyboards are, are fast. You can swipe on them. They're, you know, they're really responsive. Uh, but the problem is, is that virtual keyboards then have to interpret through your CPU at the end of the day. Um, uh, our physical keyboard, uh, you know, is, is just bare wires physically inspectable switches, right? 
There's no silicon chips. And we solved the multilingual issue by having this overlay that we put on the top. So this is like a little printed film that we put on top of these key switches. And you actually just take some screws and you take out your your language, you put your new language in, you do a setting and you're inside your new language, right? That's, that's the input method editor switching mechanism is a screwdriver, right? So it's a very, it's a very physical, uh, simple mechanism, but it's very easy to verify. At the end of the day, um, you can uh, you verify it by just holding up to the light. So this is a picture of what the keyboard looks like. You hope you can see the, the darkish areas where the switches are, you can see the wires and the connector. That's it. If there's anything else on it, then, then there's a problem at the end of the day. Um, the, the, on, on the flip side, if you want to do a touch keyboard, verification is very hard. Cap touch requires not only the whole input method error problem, but it requires proprietary chips with a, with a microcontroller firmware blob. We were talking in the earlier session about how firmware is inside everything. If you, if you look up the data sheets for um, um, sort of touchscreen controllers, you'll see like the saying, you know, the firmware revision of your touchscreen touch controller and the data sheet have to be in sync. It's, it's crazy how much code is inside of these things. And we didn't want to add another code blob uh, where we, where we um, didn't have to. Uh, uh, the screen is also very important because not only do you have the input method or ed editor problem, you have the screen scraping problem. I mean, one of the things that sort of uh, blows my mind about um, web browsers today, and I learned this during the pandemic, is that you can now share your screen with a web browser, which is, I'm like, why, why did we even add this feature? Why, who thought it was a good idea to have my web browser read my screen, right? Like, th like to me, that just sounds like, you know, two years from now, we're going to see some person be like, oh, my God, like, people have been reading, you know, scrap scraping my screen and getting all my other things I type. How is this possible? And we're like, well, because we let them in. We we added the feature. We wanted it for some reason or the other, right? So I don't want stuff going to my screen. I don't trust it, right? So we decided to build in a black and white screen. It's high DPI. has a good resolution to it uh, for the size of it. And we want it to be verifiable at the end of the day. We want to sort of have the screen also meet the same bar of verification. So um, we actually picked a screen where all of the drive electronics are built on the glass as transistors that are big enough that you can see them with an optical microscope. So this is a picture here. If you were to peel off the backlight and look at the screen, you can actually see the individual transistors that form the construction of the of the pixel drivers. Um, and the reason why we don't use a color LCD is that um, you know all of the you know uh, color LCDs they incorporate a driver IC. It's a little fleck, fleck of silicon. If you ever get a chance to tear apart a, a screen that you broke or something like that. You think, oh, it's there's nothing on it. There's no silicon. You actually see a very, it's a long, thin bar. It doesn't look like your normal chip that's square. It's actually a long, thin bar along one of the edges. And it's it's implemented in some pretty high node process, has a frame buffer, has a command interface, you know, has everything you need to sort of um, sock out a couple lines and, and, and put them someplace else. So, um, this is actually what we uh, sort of designed at the end of the day for the, for the circuit board. Um, and one of the things we also want to do is we want to help people validate their circuit boards. It's not just a matter of making it simple and single-sided and, and whatnot, but we actually will continue to publish diagrams like this as our hardware you know, goes through revision so people can look at it and say, okay, these are the parts. This is what these things do, and this is what we should look for. And if I see some something off on it, is that just a manufacturing mistake, or is that regular variance, or is that something to be worried about? So part of part of the process is also not just being open about it and making it simple to inspect, but also teaching people how to do this themselves. I don't want to, um, you know, sort of be in a situation where uh, people are relying upon us to render opinions about the trustability of their own hardware. Uh, the PCB itself, um, just a quick note on that. Uh, we we actually designed the whole circuit along attack surfaces. So we want to also think from the hardware, from the standpoint of if you had physical possession of the hardware, how might I go ahead and attack it? So we have a trusted domain and an untrusted domain, and we sort of divide them uh, between each other. And the circuit board itself is laid out. So there's actually, um, there's a metal shield that will go over a region here. I think you can see where I'm sort of outlining with this, with the mouse cursor that will actually cover all of the trusted domain items. And then there's a set of attack surfaces on it that you have to really pay attention to. And that's where that's where you would want to look at. So you, if you don't have infinite time, you don't want to spend, you know, days learning about this. Here's like six things you should look at before you use your device. And if they all look fine, fine. Like you know, it's a five second check. Um, you've got time of check to time of use. 
Um, and so uh, finally, we get to the hardest problem, which is sort of the silicon, uh, the system on chip, the SOC. How do we get evidence-based trust in CPU? Like, um, you know, it's very difficult to check and use a specific chip. So, you know, IBM uh, has, has published wonderful pictures of like this, where they show how a chip looks. You can see all the transistors, but you know how they did this is they actually cut the chip. This is a cross section of a chip. You're not gonna use that chip anymore. So it's not useful, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of, of usage. So um, instead of, you know, you know, and also this, you know, trying to top side imaging is hard because you have to remove all the dielectric, backside imaging is incomplete, blah, blah, blah. Instead of trying to rely on imaging for this generation, uh, we're using uh, the field programmable gate array. So uh, an FPGA is a large array of logic and wires that are user configured to implement a hardware design. So it comes as a generic array. It doesn't actually do anything out of the box without a configuration that you put into it. Uh, it's an array of gates as it, as it, as the name implies. And the whole concept is that we actually ship you the source code for your CPU. We give it to you, it's, it's, it's written in Python of all languages. Uh, called a language called Lidex, and it compiles down to Verilog, and then it goes gets mapped into a set of gates, which then are loadable into your device itself. And the idea is that since you can now compile your design from source, you can transfer trust, quote unquote, like software. So there's a, there is a question, of course, you know, can the gate array itself have like some evil backdoor on the inside or wherever it is? And th th there's a number of mitigating factors like you can do. Uh, people who are familiar with the, the security lingo you do address space layout randomization uh, on kernels to prevent you know exploits you can sort of do some random mapping of the hardware to, to frustrate people's attempts to backdoor your devices but at the end of the day the whole idea is to narrow that time of check to time of use by allowing you to compile your own cpu from source you don't have to we'll ship you a reference cpu compiled but if you want to go ahead and install the tool chain it's not small but um, you can go ahead and compile your own cpu from source is a very quick look on the inside of it. Um, there's, we actually have, uh, like I said, uh, putting a lot of effort into documenting as well, not just trying to push code and, and hope people can understand it. But uh, if you look at some of our um, uh, some of our collateral, you'll see diagrams like this, which sort of you can use to explore all the items on the inside of our system on chip. Um, and the biggest potential at the end of the day is that by using an FPGA, we can move the point of check closer to the end of the user. So the vision ideally is we want to have someday a one click tool to verify a bit stream. So people can say, I've got a bit stream. Does this do the right thing? And it's all open source and you can do it. We're not there yet today. And to be clear, that's a hard problem because there's a lot of tool chain that has to be done to get there, but there's a path to it. At least we see it. Um, and I think, I think it's doable. It's just a matter of time. So I think we'll get there. Um, so this is the point at the talk where I kind of sort of pivot more into the into the main theme. Um, now that we've kind of gone over the background of what Precursor is and why we're doing it, what we hope to accomplish, um, or we we'll talk a bit of more about sort of like the human computer interaction aspect of it, right? So I, I like to, I feel like the final frontier in security is is HCI, human computer in, uh, interface um, factors, right? Um, because if you build something that is perfectly secure, at the end of the day, what you find is that people hack the people. Humans are the weak link at the end of the day in any type of security. Phishing attacks, impersonation attacks, ID theft, these are all types of problems that we're gonna experience actually more and more, unfortunately, as the security gets better and better and we invest more and more in putting our stuff online. Um, so some of you may be familiar with these bank tokens that the banks give out. This is sort of an example of a minimal attack surface, a simple inflexible interface device, but the whole idea of it, they call it a, a second factor of authentication. It's another device that is very difficult to hack, at least remotely. I mean, in person, you can do whatever you want with it, but at least remotely, it doesn't have a network interface. And you can use it to prove that, you know, you have like this shared secret with the bank. Um, <clears throat> on the other end of it, we have things like browsers. They're featureable. They're, they're feature for, they're flexible. You can, they're basically operating systems in and of itself. They have an intractable attack surface. And ironically, people are pushing people towards logging into banks using their mobile phone apps with browsers that are basically, you know, node packaged into some electron framework with whatever else going on. And they call it a second factor. I mean, it's, you know, when you put everything into one device and you give it a huge attack surface, I'm sorry, you have one factor again, right? So it's not really, you know, we've sort of taken two steps forward, one step back, you know, in, in this in this escalation of 
of human human computer interaction for, um, form factors. So precursor tries to hit this balance of being right in the middle. We want to be just enough and no more, and we want to have a uh, sort of a securable attack surface on the device itself, um, <clears throat> which means that. Uh, sorry. Next slide here. Uh, so to try and illustrate what we're trying to do a little more clearly, I have this sort of Venn diagram chart. I like to do these sorts of, sorts of things in my talk to sort of talk about the three domains that we're thinking about. So there, there are things that are hackable, so they're unlocked, and the design source is mostly available. It would be like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, these types of things. They're hackable, right? They're not pocket ready. You can't stick you know, Raspberry Pi immediately in your pocket. If you did, it would poke you in the leg because it has a header sticking off of it, right? Um, and it doesn't have evidence-based trust because it has that Broadcom uh, SOC on the inside. You don't know what's inside that Broadcom SOC. It still could have a backdoor. It could have other issues going on the inside. It has, has lots of firmware blobs at the end of the day. Then you have things on the right-hand side that are pocket ready. They're like your iPhone, most Android phones. Like, you know, they're they're really beautiful. They stick in your pocket, but you can't hack them in the sense that you know, they're not unlocked. Their design source is definitely not mostly available. And there's no evidence-based trust at all. You may trust them, but it's not because there's an evidence that this hardware does what it says it does. It's because you trust the vendor. It's a social reputation contract with the vendor is why you have trust. And it's not an evidence-based relationship. It's a faith-based relationship with your mobile phone vendor. And then you have some devices that allow for evidence-based trust. Like there's some, like uh, some of these devices here, where you can actually compile your CPU from source, run it on the hardware, and say this is actually executing the instructions I think it's going to execute. And in the it, amongst these three domains, Precursor is sort of like one of the few devices that uh, that gives you all three of these properties in a single device. Um, and pocket readiness is sort of one of the big differentiating points on that. So to sort of um, belaboring that point a little bit more. Um, so here's like a functionally equivalent piece of open hardware to what we're shipping in Precursor. It's it's the ULX3S. It's this wonderful lattice-based FPGA system. It's easy to verify and trust. You can compile your CPU co core for it. It's totally open. It's affordable. It's affordable. The bad side of it is that it's got no screen or keyboard, right? So you, you know it's, it uses an HCI problem, obviously, to it, and you can't carry it in your pocket. It does have some buttons, though, which is good, and it has like a little thing for a screen that you can plug in and carry around. So it could get there, right? Um, on the on the other side, um, we have some everyday use, you know, kind of open phones, open hardware phones like the Librem Five. The good news is they're pocket ready. This is definitely a very pocketable phone. Uh, it runs an open source software stack. It has a browser, so it's it's usable. The bad side is that it also inherits all the attack surfaces of Linux and browsers and SOCs at the end of the day. And the ugly is that you may just end up having to carry two devices anyways in practice because the Librem 5 may not get you all the way to being everything you need in terms of an app store and running all the native apps that you have to do to interact with everyone on a daily basis. And so you'll have this phone plus another device anyways. And so now you have like, you know, you know, still carrying two devices, but you haven't gotten there in terms of the evidence-based trust. That was the thing that, that you cared about. So uh, uh, our point of differentiation is that we wanted to take open hardware, which is which is particularly stuff, you know, on this, on this circle here, sort of things from the lineage of Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and Snickerdoodles and these types of things, and move them towards the pocket-ready side. That's, that's, a, that's sort of one of the major thrusts that we had in, in the, in the concept and design of this. We want to have a thing that looks and feels like a gadget, fits into your everyday life, so you would, wouldn't feel weird bringing it out at a dinner party and checking a message on it. It wouldn't be like, you know, I'm going to pull out a pile of wires and like an HDMI display and set my Raspberry Pi and start typing, you know, you know, in the hawker stall or something like this. It would look a little weird, right? This one you would be, you know, it would not be out of place, uh, but still is also trustable. Um, it has no compromises on simplicity verification or openness. Um, which means that uh, in terms of making our case, it was much more than just uh, having a pretty face to it. You know, we want, it, uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about what went into designing the actual hardware, the actual mechanical stuff around uh, Precursor itself. So it was actually a multidisciplinary exercise in, in design, uh, material science, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. So, you know, uh, when we started the design, we thought about a lot of different concepts. We actually started from a place where, we're, where we looked at a paper from uh, Microsoft of all the places where they did this um, phone cover. It was actually, a, you know, for their, for the, whatever the Microsoft phone was at the time, it was like a little cover, those e-ink, and you could close it on top. 
And the idea is that you would have like the static e-ink display that could display other content next to your phone. And the, the, the idea is you could sling your boarding pass over there. Remember back when you get on an airplane? You could sling your boarding pass over there, and if your phone was dead, the, the e-ink display would preserve your boarding pass, and it would actually scan because it's e-ink. It's not like a reflective display, all sorts of stuff. So it, was, it had all these kind of nifty little features. Uh, yeah, uh, it had all these nifty little features um, for for you know from the human computer inter interaction standpoint that I really liked. The whole it was a really good way of having a secondary device next to your phone that, that I thought was very clean. So we started playing around with the ink. We actually got some ink samples. This is here is an example of a UI mock we did on a piece of ink that actually had both red, black, and white colors on it. Um, and we realized actually there's actually a security problem with using ink in that like we removed power and it's still showing the last message. So uh, there's actually a, a little bit of volatility is a, good, is a good thing because you want to be able to, you know, erase messages uh, and not have them sort of just persist there, I thought. So then we went towards this uh, smart memory LCD displays, which we're using the final case. We sort of prototyped it uh, hanging off here off a of Raspberry Pi. This is like an early dev board we're using to sort of test keyboard concepts, uh, random noise generators. Also, like basically we just did a, a you know, a, a trash tape out of a circuit board just to see if we get anything to work. And, uh, and we did some tests, put some incredibly small fonts, put some black and white stuff on, took an XKCD comment, stuck it on a uh, comic and stuck it on there just to sort of see if we're even in the right zone in terms of UI standpoint. It seemed to, it seemed to be okay. And so then we got to sketching, just drawing a lot of sketches of what the hardware might look like. Um, after doing that, we had to do a lot of learning. Um, you know, I hadn't really done a mobile phone before. It's not a thing that, uh, you know, you're trained to do in college. Um, and so we went to a bunch of factories and looked at how they made keyboards for them, took apart existing keyboards and did teardown analysis to figure out sort of what were the tricks and, and, and what were the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of a variety of keyboards from a variety of keyboard based devices. Um, and finally sort of synthesize that all together into sort of some realistic ish 3D renderings that we could use to sort of talk about, are we getting there? Are we, is this device thin enough? Is it going to be, is it the right size? You know, you know, there's this sort of a lot of people comment on this awkward bezel, you know, uh, of availability on it because we're so used to sort of bezel-less phones today. It's like a big thing in smartphones. Um, it's like a fad, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but you know, we don't have enough money to make a custom LCD display. And if we made the keyboard as narrow as the screen, you wouldn't be able to type on it. So there you go. That was like one of the design trade-offs we had to deal with. Um, and so we played around with a lot of different um, renderings, trying to figure out what uh, would go on. And then, uh, you know, we went and made some hand feel prototypes. Once you've gone and thought about the design on the screen, there's no substitute when you're building consumer hardware to just, you know, build the real thing, hold it and use it, see how it feels, right? And that really helped inform a lot more of our, like before we even got to the refinement stage of how everything packs in, we, we had these um, sort of hand feel prototypes uh, and play around with different materials for the bezel and, 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 and the design. And so the material science itself actually were, was, was a really um, uh, difficult challenge in itself because picking the right materials is very important. If you, if you remember, uh, this is a picture of an iPhone 6. Um, if you guys remember the bend gate thing where you, know, you could sit on an iPhone 6 and it would like bend and snap. It, they were using a certain alloy of aluminum, a 6,000 series alloy of aluminum that uh, had uh, sort of some weak spots. And, you know, as a, as now having designed phones and understanding design, you can see actually the weak point and I can understand a bit like you know, the trade-offs they made and how this ended up being a thing, but, you know, people weren't happy with it. So you have to sort of go through now this material science um, exercise of sampling steel, brass, different alloys of aluminum and comparing their strength, their finish, their durability, their availability and price. So we sort of started this sort of, um, sort of, uh, continuous integration of materials into our design by essentially getting different swatches of material, hand them off to a really good CNC provider, and then creating versions of our case with various types of material. We could pick them up, feel them, abuse them, scratch them, test them for conductivity, throw them in ocean water, take them out, dry them off, you know, do all these types of things to try, try and like, you know, understand the material properties. Because there's one thing to read a book, it's another thing to sort of just experience them. Uh, and so we iterated a lot until we finally arrived at a couple of materials that we think that uh, meet our, you know, sort of requirements in terms of durability, uh, uh, you know, good look and feel, 
and cost, uh, most importantly. I mean, a lot of people ask me, like, why don't you use titanium? You know, it's an obvious great material to use. It costs like $1,000 for us to mill a, mill a case out because we'd scrap so many of them uh, on the way to making a single one that would work or something like that. It's, you know, there's, there's some great materials out there, but they're just too hard to work with. Um, and then we have to pick colors, which is really hard because everyone has a different opinion as to what looks good. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the budget. We don't have the budget to market to you like Apple does to make you think that this is the best color because they, they, they're they smart and they had good designers and they picked the, the right color and you're dumb and therefore, you know, uh, you, you should like what they did. Um, and everyone has a different taste for what they want to do. We also don't have the budget to make 100 different colors and put them in the supply chain. I think I think we're going to have two types of colors, one for the Omakase version and one for the regular version um, on this on this particular come out. Um, so, you know, we're basically going with black because it's, it's uh, or a darkest shade of gray, um, which is, uh, it's a safe color. Most people are okay with it, but we're playing around with some things like different bezel formats or whatever it is. Like this, this sort of firm pattern on the bezel has been a little controversial. It's not one of those things where people either hate it, I'd say like 90% of people hate it, or you really love it. Like so there's a certain group of people who are just, oh my God, I have to have that, right? So it's like very, it's very difficult to sort of, um, uh, get that line right. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, gadgets have transcended functionality. They really are a fashion statement these days. People buy things a lot in part because of the color they have and the, the feel they have and what they can show other people that they have about it. Um, and so this is part of the process that we have to deal with now as, as hardware designers. We have to sort of acknowledge that hum the part of the HCI experience is, is the color and the feel and, and the look of a device. Um, and so, uh, yes, okay, I see with it. We're starting to run out of time already. Uh, I'll sort of push this through this quickly. Um, then we get into sort of the mechanical engineering of the device itself. Um, so this is, this is the point at which we uh, really start to um, get into the details, make sure we've got a budget for all the height of the components and that everything is put together correctly. Uh, we're starting to invest a lot more in terms of the drawings and, 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 and delineating all the, all the, all the points. So there's, a, you know, sort of figuring out where to pack all the components into something that's only a few millimeters tall is a bit of a game of Tetris. A lot of trade-offs on the inside in terms of durability, assemblability. And one thing we didn't want to give up was the ability for this thing to be easily inspected. So we didn't, we couldn't do that cheat of let's just use glue and hold it down, right? Because that's the thing, uh, thing that happens a lot in mobile phones today. We can we can lose a millimeter by just using glue because we don't have a screw anymore or something like that. So we so we really had to sort of figure out how to pack everything in and still make it easy to take apart. Um, and then from the electrical engineering side, we had to, you know, put a lot of rules upon ourselves. Like, you know, we wanted no component thicker than 1.5 millimeters, um, you know, general component on the, on the circuit board thicker than that, which means, you know, the good news is from the mobile phone ecosystem, there's a lot of things that are already quite thin and small that meets our requirements, but we also had to think about the openness of the component. Was it easy enough to get? Was it easy enough to get the data sheets of it? Did it meet the functionality? Um, is this cost reasonable? Can we actually buy it? Is it on Optanium? Is it a thing that Apple's purchased only and will not sell to anyone else? Like this, these are all things that we had to deal with in terms of um, getting stuff to fit. And then finally, you know, we had to bring it all together. There's a lot of attention to the details of the finishing touches. We have custom finish on our on our torque screws, so I didn't want to use a, a, a hex head or sorry, a cross head Phillips because those things suck. They strip. You know, they, they don't. They don't work well, uh, in my opinion. We've had torque screws for decades now. I don't understand we don't have them on everything. Um, but, you know, they're hard to get, actually. The torque screws are not common, so we had to find a vendor that would make them for us in the right size and get the right color on them uh, so that we could go ahead and put them in the design instead of just using off-the-shelf uh, crosshead screws. <clears throat> and then the edges of the, of the case itself are done with what's called a diamond beveling. And so uh, what we do is we actually, instead of machining and polishing it, we use a diamond bit that is so sharp that the cut of it is mirror finish in and of itself. So you get this nice sort of, you can see the, uh, this sort of shine on the edge. It's a very subtle touch, but I kind of I kind of like these sorts of accents that, that don't stand in your face, but sort of give it a, a little bit of refinement, a little bit of, a little bit of something that's um, a little bit nicer to, 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 to look at at the end of the day. And, uh, and we are going to ship a torque screwdriver in the case with every single device because they are hard to find. 
Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we have a pocketable device um, with, uh, I didn't read your mind, I read the comments. The, 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 uh, <laughs> we have a pocketable device uh, with no compromise on ease of inspection. Uh, so at the at, at the end of the day, we want we build a device that you can go in your pocket and you can actually take it apart and inspect with the screwdriver. We put the screws in the front, um, and we've made it so that the cables come out in a reasonable fashion. You're not going to break anything. You take it apart and say, "Look, this is everything." Put it back together again, and then and then use it. So the idea is you can have a time of check to time of use loop loop that's very small. You don't have to always do it, but it's available to you. That's that's the idea. So precursor that you know we. Again, we try to embody those three principles I talked about earlier in our talk. We want to make it simple so you can verify it. A full system, so you're, you're verifying the whole system, not just components. And we're empowering uh, end users to verify and seal their hardware by publishing documentation, educating users, and um, giving them the source code to do these types of things. Uh, the current development status is that the, the hardware is production ready. Uh, we're ramping the supply chain as much as you can in a pandemic. It turns out that a confluence of things like a huge amounts of economic stimulus going to the, you know, people are buying a lot of chips now in the supply chain, plus the, the factories haven't really fully opened, plus Bitcoin is through the roof, so all the Bitcoiners are buying all the silicon. It's, uh, it's, we're going to be a little behind schedule in terms of our ramp because we can't, um, you know, get the parts because there's so much competition right now for, for electronics in the supply chain, but we're, you know, that's, that's my headache, not yours. I'm worrying, and that's, that's what keeps me up at night these days. Um, the good news is from the software side, our, our OS, our full custom OS that we're working on it, um, which is written by Sean Zobs Cross, uh, is coming together. We now have a, a, a minimum viable product shell chat app running on it. Um, and just giving a quick shout out to uh, the NLNet Foundation for giving us a grant, which uh, allowed us to get to this point uh, quite far, actually, to get us to the point of the, of the crowdfunding. Um, without having to rely on all that continuous integration you saw of all the cases and all that design, all that stuff. That was pre-crowdfunding. We didn't do that after crowdfunding. That was before crowdfunding. And that was done um, in part thanks to, th thanks to this grant. Um, and uh, you can go to this website here, precursor.dev, to learn more about it. That's our, our crowdfunding site. We also have a GitHub repo, um, which I think, yeah, you can see uh, down here. Uh, if you want to actually look at the application and the OS for it, we uh, the Sean was actually really insistent, and in I, I think he's, he's very right in doing this, in creating his, his operating system to be multi-platform. So Zeus actually can run on your desktop in this environment. It's, it's a mini, it's not, it doesn't have all the security properties of it, but it has all the API calls. And, uh, and you can start coding for your precursor today, even without having one. So you can go to um, our wiki, betrusted.io, uh, which is our github.com, our GitHub site. And, uh, and you can visit the wiki and you can see the instructions for how to like run um, uh, um, our app. And this is an example of sort of our initial shell test. The idea is you type actually to your shell as you're chatting to it and it comes back to you with like, you know, what commands you have available. And, you know, it shows that we have like emoji and Hansa already live inside of our OS. And, the, and those are things that we're working on. Um, so these, these, are, these are things you can start uh, playing with today even before you get the hardware in your hand. Uh, and that's it. Uh, for the talk, I know that we were running a little behind schedule, so I tried to uh, push things ahead a little bit. There was originally time for questions, but I'll leave it to uh, Homfook to see if she, if we, if we want to do that, or we just want to cut to the next um, talk and stay in schedule. So thanks everyone for um, you know tuning in, and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of it was nice actually to have the comments on the side. Uh, it felt a little more interactive than just screaming into the void as I usually feel. Uh, in the pandemic. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Bunny. Um, like uh, um, I'm taking over from here, and uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to say that we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Also, and we can just later on make up for it as we have some breaks. And um, I see the first question is uh, from Roland. Roland, would you like to ask uh, your question directly? Uh, yes, certainly. Apologies for the background noise. I'm sort of fascinated by the inspection of the screen in particular. Mm -hmm. but, no very, but I know very little about chip layout. How much do I need to understand about chip layout to convince myself that the screen only contains what it's supposed to contain? Uh, okay. So the idea behind the screen, let me see if I can just very quickly get to... 
I think the slides should be easy to find. I'm almost there, am I? Oh no, that was loud. I give up on the, the, the slide. Um, the, oh, here it is. The idea, actually, you don't have to understand anything about chip layout to to understand what's in the screen because what you're looking for is the lack of presence of the silicon chip, right? So the idea is that uh, when you look at your screen, uh, you could look at the transistors one by one. It's going to take a long time, and I don't think it's a very productive exercise because the transistors are so large. You're not, you can't. They're big enough. You can't really do anything with them other than drive the screen. It's 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 pack full already. There's no, there's no place to, to you can hide another flip flop in there. Maybe what are you going to do with one bit of information? Okay. Maybe, maybe something, but it's not, not a lot. You're not. Um, so, so, and also there's another complication that we have a backlight on it, which keeps you from being able to put the high power light on the backside to look at it. So what you're really looking for is you're looking for the lack of this fleck of silicon, uh, on it. So if someone went ahead and put another extra piece of silicon on the glass, a little chip on glass thing like they do in most other LCDs, then you know that this is not the LCD you want to use, right? That's all you're looking for at the end of the day. It's a very binary one or zero thing. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh, there's uh, another question from Mr. Marco. Marco, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, hello, Mani. Um, hey. So uh, my question goes more like uh, the target audience uh, audience of this device. Uh, mm. Do you think like the general public uh, would and should be interested in something like this? And then um, do you think it makes sense to have a device like this when uh, the general public will have other phone and would do the uh, connections to the uh, different uh, banks and all those through through a normal browser, because this doesn't cover like everyone's day-to-day -day, uh, needs in terms of technology, right. right? Right, right. Yeah, would would or should are different, very different answers. Um, I I I don't think I'm realistic. I don't think everyone's going to be clamming for one of these from day one. I mean, obviously, this is this is a bit of uh, an academic exercise, almost in trying to figure out how do we build a device that even looks normal-ish and, and starts to satisfy some of these requirements. So I, I look at it more as a starting point. That's why it's called precursor. It's it, we're, we're, not, we're definitely not there yet. This is not going to be it. But I think it hopefully moves the goalpost mini me forward enough that we as a community can start figuring out how do we use this and how do we make it more mainstream? How do we get it into people's lives? I do think that, <clears throat> and, and, and also to be clear, uh, I, I don't intend this device to replace your phone. You, there is a place for that complexity. That complexity gets us wonderful things like browsers and cats and on the internet and these things that we just don't want to get rid of in the, in, for the sake of security. And it doesn't matter if you look at cats on the internet because you usually get cats on the internet. But when we're going to do banking, you still also want to have the app on your phone to do banking. But you want a true second factor, right? You want to. I think what we're what we're getting at. And unfortunately, this is the this is the case for most security products. Is that we, the general public, feels they don't need it until it's too late, right? So the thing that will catalyze the popularity of devices like this is unfortunately going to be an incident that will affect a lot of people. And when they say, "Oh crap!" like I thought my phone was trustable, but in fact, you know, we all had some terrible situation happen, and people clamor about it and why hasn't the industry solved this and why don't we gain these types of things and then finally based on that demand uh, people may be more willing to have a second factor or they may be looking for second factor situations so uh, you know no I don't think it's a thing that everyone's going to need from day one but there are definitely people today who are not developers but more users who have come to me and says I definitely want one of these journalists who want to keep in touch with contacts, they want to keep very confidential, and they have state level adversaries against them, obviously is, is a very small market, but I think is a very important market because it's important to get the truth out there. Um, but then uh, a slightly larger market that, you know, I am not terribly closely connected to myself, but I, I acknowledge it's a very uh, lucrative market is the crypto guys. Those guys, um, you know, uh, rely a lot on digital technology to hold in increasingly large amounts of wealth. And so they have concerns about phishing and, and reliability and storage. And these people are willing, the types who are willing to carry a second device around to have a wallet that secures 
you know, some portion of their assets, right? Those types of people are, are not necessarily developers, but they are actually users who understand and would be willing to do it. And I think that as, as time goes on, we'll sort of gradually shift towards a slightly more mainstream uh, application of this. And hopefully as time goes on, and if this project is successful, we'll have a V2 that's a little more powerful, that's a little more mainstream, has a little more uh, connectivity on it uh, without compromising on simplicity, without compromising on trustability. That's Those are the big caveats, right? Because we don't want to just reinvent another mobile phone. I'm not going to just throw a bunch of crap on the inside and make it hard to verify and say, yep, you know, you know, we won. That's not, that's, that's, that, that's the really hard battle is, is, is making sure that we hold true to our, our mission without, um, you know, uh, while still serving the general public. And um, yeah, there's a final question from uh, mm -hmm. Juan. Juan, would you like to ask your question? I activated your microphone. All right. Um, so how oh, do Juan. you plan to, hi, hi, Bonin. How do you plan to develop and uh, get the people in the software community uh, involved in the software firmware apps development? And do you think the phone should have some sort of capability to auto update? And um, why do you decide to start a OS from scratch? Um, in other words, what's your strongest argument for, you know, writing the OS from scratch? Okay. Um, how do you yeah. write the, the trade off? Yeah. It's a, those are, that's, those are a series of hard questions there. I'll start with the last one. Uh, there's the honest answer and there's the there's the technical answer. The honest answer is we wanted to write an OS from scratch, right? That's there's the fundamentally it was an itch to scratch. The but the the more technical answer to it is that um, we wanted to build the problem is a lot of the OSs today are are too complicated and too hard to validate from the bottom up. And we also wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to rethink a lot of traditional things like POSIX file systems and uh, e ABIs and all these interfaces that we carry a lot of legacy garbage along with us that actually inflates the size of our OSs and makes them more complex. And so we have an opportunity to build a file system that is well suited towards systems with virtual memory and flash and these types of things. It gets rid of a lot of legacy stuff. And so we're looking at, you know, taking advantage of the fact that we're writing the OS from the bottom, picking up every piece we put in, thinking about it and being like, hmm, do we really need that? Can we shave off this piece, do that? Can we fit it in? Can we keep it in a small code size, right? And so one of the debates we have routinely inside is like, you know, we say we could solve that problem with a new syscall. We're like, do we really need a new syscall? Do we really have to add this? Can we remove a syscall if we add one? Like there's a big, for me, it's actually a big win when we manage to remove lines of code from the OS because it makes it more inspectable and more maintainable. And so I hope we can keep that spirit alive as we grow the OS and grow the community and get people more involved in it. Um, but that's that's a, a very big priority is to make it so that uh, an average person, an average coder, I should say, could pick up the OS, read our documentation within a day, you know, be a, this is the boot instruction and this is the path that it takes to get to running my application and I believe it. Like, I have confidence that I haven't like, oh, there was like a little weird scene change that happened that I didn't quite get that went through a blob like that's that's kind of what it is today in, on, on OS even if you if you spend like a month looking at these things um, in terms of engaging the developer community uh, I'll be the first to admit I'm like pretty actually not great at, at, at community management I'm more of a technical person but I hope that we can do better at this and uh, you know we've we've of course we publish everything on github uh, we're trying really hard to add a lot of documentation um, out there. So I think I put on the wiki, um, uh, let's see, a link to our documentation here. If you actually go, if you actually visit that, uh, we're, we're really as on the fly, as we go through every component, what I do after we get to a release, I go back and I write all the docs and I fix the docs. I'm trying not to just, like do all the docs at the end. We're trying to dynamically keep generating, keeping them up to date. So people can follow on. And then we're doing this thing where you can, and in hosted boats, start developing apps today. So you could you could go here, you could go to um, Zeus Core, um, and if you have Rust installed in your system, you can do cargo X task run, and it should just pop up this UI 
and you should be able to be running our basic shell chat application. So developers today can start looking at it, poking at it, and getting a feel for it. it it's different on hardware, obviously, because the performance is very different. And the hardware actually does, you know, memory protection, and this doesn't do memory protection, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and a lot of the hardware features are only emulated with like fixed numbers, like the battery life is always going to be fifty percent because that's all we report. Right? So it doesn't emulate a battery. But um, but we're trying we're trying to um, find ways to improve and engage the community um, from an early basis. So you know, it's early days from that standpoint. I think we you know we're still about unfortunately you know. Uh, several months away from shipping any any hardware. So we have some time to figure this out. So if you have any ideas or feedback or people want to contribute, we're, we're, we're very open to the idea. Um, we have an IRC channel, uh, which is listed somewhere in one of these slides um, here. You can pop in there. Uh, we, we're mostly there. I mean, you'll have to be looking at the screen to see the message. It doesn't come up on my phone or anything like that. Um, uh, or you can open issues on GitHub. We try to be pretty responsive there. And so we really want to engage with uh, people who are genuinely interested in developing and doing things. Doesn't mean we're always going to take your commits. We're going to be curative. We're going to be um, try to keep focused. You know, and, and, and the answer a lot of times is if you want to do, like there's a big group of people who want SCL4 in it. Great. Love it. I want to see that on it. But well, that's not going to be our core effort. We, I think SCL4 is a potentially really interesting powerful OS has capabilities built into it. It has a lot of good ideas. It's, you know, it's uh, mathematically provable, whatever it is, right? You know, these are all wonderful properties. Um, and, uh, and and I really hope, you know, if, if, if the community ends up forking and doing their own thing, if everyone just really wants to run Linux on it, all right, so, yeah, uh, whatever, <laughs> you guys do it, right? It's open. Uh, how about the auto update though? Uh, how do you uh, like really uh, plan to fix something that is yeah, yeah, okay, uh, update. I, I, I personally dislike auto updates um, because you're, you're just forcing code down someone's mouth and I don't know what's in it. Half the time the auto updates interact with something and break something. So this might be more of a philosophical issue. Um, I guess number one, I hope we have a code release standard that's high enough. We don't have to just put, we don't rely on updates as like the way to be lazy. So I want updates to be rare. Um, I want um, users to be in charge of accepting the update. Uh, and in terms of doing updates themselves, uh, we, we, we do have, I mean, basically the entire kernel, the FPGA image itself and the embedded controller image, all of these things uh, run out of a flash ROM, which can be updated. So for example, the FPGA firmware itself, once it's loaded into the FPGA, sorry, my phone ringing, stop that. Yeah. Um, once the, once the FPGA has loaded its firmware itself, you can actually replace the FPGA image and the next time you reboot it, you better have done it right because otherwise you have a brick, but you can actually completely rewire your FPGA. You can actually change, you can add instructions to your CPU on the fly in your device if you're careful about it, right? And so the process there would be, uh, you, would, you would have an FPGA, it's running live in your system, you would download the FPGA binary, it's about two megabytes into RAM, validate it, make sure it's right, and you would then encrypt it to the keys on your device, which are unique to your device, and then write it into the slot of memory where the FPGA goes, right? And then at that point, you can reboot it, and then the, the FPGA will decrypt itself from your root keys there inside of your device, right? So that would be the general path, but that would be a user thing. You would actually type, you know, get update, do update, that type of thing. That would be my idea. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's not the most ergonomic update experience, but that's also partially my prejudice in that I don't like ergonomic update experiences. I want updates. I actually want them to be hard. They should be hard. And I find that developers who rely on auto updates tend to use it as a crutch to be like, just push it out. We'll update it later, right? Just just whatever, right? The, you do, your release standard goes down as updates become easier inevitably inside projects. And I, and I, and and it's almost like going to the gym. It's like, it's like I'm going to make it hard for us to do an update, which means that we're, it's going to make it hard to push code, which means you have to do a better job. I don't know if it's the right idea to do it, but that's, but that's, that's where we're initially angling towards. We'll see where we end up. I think, I, I think I've burned a lot of time for someone else at this point in time. <laughs> I'm sorry.
Okay, so we have planned with some breaks uh, in, in between where we can uh, make up with it. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, of course, like, thank you very much. Uh, Bunny, it's uh, been a pleasure um, yeah. as, as always. And uh, I always have the feeling that you say, oh, I don't know what to talk about and so on. I, and, and, and at the end of your sessions, I just feel there's so much more we can talk about and so much uh, uh, people want to know. And for the next time, maybe I, uh, we should um, also like Think about an ask me anything question. You just could give a short presentation, and I, I, like people just asking more and more, and really want to get into detail. So um, that would be sure. a possibility, maybe. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I mean, you're the one who suggested the topic for this, so it's good. I mean, like, I, it's the problem for me is I, I live in this little hole, like you're here in Singapore, and I don't know what people care about anymore, right? I'm just like, <laughs> like today I'm going to go solder five circuit boards. That's that's what I'm excited about, right? But no one wants to know about that, right? That's boring. <laughs> Why not? And uh, I always like your examples. I think uh, uh, at one point you gave the example, uh, if we go out in a hawker stall and we eat something and we take out our device, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I, I really miss Singapore. Well, I've been there and done that. I've been that guy in the hawker stall with like the wires and everyone's walking by and the uncle's like, you know, like the auntie's looking at kind of a little scoldingly, tussy, tussy, what is this guy doing in the hawker stall? <laughs> I don't want other people to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much for, for um, yeah, this session and for sharing these nice examples. And uh, of course, thank you very much for your work. It's very important and uh, we all appreciate it um, really um, very much and very deeply. So I hope uh, you um, find some other interesting talks here at the event. We have um, Open yeah. Tab coming up. We have um, uh, Eric Pan from Seed Studio coming up. Um, yeah, a lot cool. of uh, interesting sessions. And um, awesome. yeah, t on Tuesday, uh, Greg Kroh Hartman, um, the Linux kernel maintainer. Oh, awesome. Nice. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Have a good Cheers. afternoon. And yep, uh, yeah, keep in touch. Thank you. you yep, bye.